Hello, everyone. Welcome to the, the 12th presentation of BA Slash. So I'm Monique Cole, a management consultant at BAE Systems Applied Intelligence. I'm helping organizations with their digital products, innovation, transformation journeys, and cybersecurity. So I started this BA Slash group um, at the start of COVID. The aim is to get more people to be equipped for the evolving changes in the markets by sharing insights of different expertise. We have got Alan and uh, Marianne joining us to, to host the event. So would you like to, to introduce yourself, um, Alan, first? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Alan Wishart. Um, I'm currently working as a product owner in uh, uh, an insure tech, looking after customer journeys for insurance. Um, before that, I've had um, roles both in the business as uh, insurance underwriters, uh, brokers, and uh, about 20 years worth of uh, business analysis experience. That's great. Thank you. Marianne, next. Hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Marianne Sears. I am currently working as a lead business analyst at BP. Um, for the last four to five years, I've been um, working as a contract BA, mainly in the agile environment. Um, most of my experience, I come from a technical background. So I've been, I have over 20 years working in, in various positions in, in the technical IT space. That's great. Cool. Thanks so much. And yeah, so Marianne, Alan, and I uh, have been evaluating the format of BA Slash. Um, in essence, we want to make sure that we are serving and reaching as many people with the, the time and efforts we volunteer in this group. So we would like to invite you to make your biggest impact as well. So you can join us as an organizer, share our events and recording with your network, as well as to follow BA Slash on social media channels. What we are planning to do before the, um, the presentation, we thought we will just have a, a icebreaker for, for everyone to have a go. So, so think of a, a color that you, you like and you'll be sent to a, a breakout room and you can share a, a one-liner with your uh, breakout room fellows, the question on, on the slide. So I'll, I'll put that in all the questions in the chat. So when you're in the breakout room, you, you have to have a look. We aim to have four people in each room so everyone can, can share their one line in, in one minute and have a quick hello and then we, we come back and, and share with us any kind of interesting findings and new people that you, you have uh, just met. So yeah, so let's, let's join a bit of breakout room and we come back in four minutes. My, my group, we focused on, um, we all answered or shared um, I, um, thoughts on the red, on how we, what's our happy place. Um, and we all felt, I mean, that we, uh, most of us basically said that we'd like to take a step back and try to not do a one size fits all, try to listen to, uh, listen to the business stakeholders and try to meet their needs rather than one size fits all. That's cool. Yeah. So yeah, so thanks so much for, for the sharing. Really happy to, to have um, Darren to share his top tips. And Darren, he has been a former colleague at BA Systems of mine. He has been highly rated by, by colleagues. And another special thing about Darren is he has been a, a search dog handler volunteer. And I, I really wish this was a physical event and we, we get to meet uh, the fluffy, lovely one. So yeah, so we'll, without further ado, I'll um, invite Darren to our virtual stage. I'm going to share with you guys this evening what, what, I, what I believe and my view is of Agile. Hopefully it can help you guys um, in the way that you work and you can use it um, to make decisions um, in the best way that you can. But I, before we go into the presentation, I just want to go over a little bit my, about my background. So wanting to touch on it a little bit there. I'm an engineer at heart. I spent 20 plus odd years as a CNC++ developer principally in aerospace and avionics and, and uh, Formula One uh, and BAE systems, obviously applied intelligence in Guildford. Um, I've been doing kind of what I call new ways of working, um, other people called agile um, since 2006. Um, so I, uh, my, my boss at the time walked in, at the, in on a Monday morning 
and put a book on my desk called uh, Scrum by Jeff Sutherland and said, do that. And I really had no idea what it was or why I was doing it, but I did it. And I, and I made all the mistakes and uh, got all the war wounds and the bruises of doing stuff, not necessarily the way it was intended is probably the best way of putting it. Um, and, and since then, since 2006, I've um, worked as, you know, development manager, engineering lead, software developer, product owner, scrum master, a whole host of different roles, uh, doing lots of different things in different environments and domains. Um, but I think pr principally uh, my role now is to help organizations um, understand how they can better deliver outcomes for their customers. And I think, you know, I, I deliberately worded it in that way, right? It's not to help people do agile, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, my, 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 my role is, is all about, you know, it's about people, it's about processes, it's about environments, it's about tooling, it's all, it's all of the above um, to help improve the flow of work through, uh, through our organizations to our customers. So I think that's probably about enough for me as, as an intro. Um, I'm going to dive in. I've got a lot of content to cover today, right? So I, 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 some people often tell me that I go very fast through my content, and it's because I've got a lot of good information that I'd like to share. So apologies for going very quickly through this. Um, obviously, as Monique says, the, the slides will get shared afterwards. A um, um, couple of things on that slide there. If you know, look me up on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting better at being active on LinkedIn. I'm not like some of these people who spend all their lives on it. So, uh, but I am active on LinkedIn. And um, for some of you who work in principally the larger organizations, one thing that always makes me smile is that web address at the bottom there, which is the half fast Agile Manifesto. Um, so if you haven't seen it, go and look and uh, probably make you laugh. Um, but let's start. Um, well, people will go on there. So just firstly, what, why, what are we trying to do as, as NatWest? So I work for NatWest. I've been here for three years. Uh, I, was, I, I was asked to join NatWest to help them actually start doing this stuff as opposed to talking about it. Um, any of you who work in financial services institutions know that they're really good at talking about stuff, but less good at implementing it. So, so my role over the last three years has been helping NatWest um, implement new ways of working, um, Agile, Lean, whatever you want to call it, within, within the group. Um, and that's working horizontally across many, many different parts of the organization. So um, within retail, within commercial, HR, marketing, finance, um, risk, uh, RBS, RB, uh, Royal Bank Scotland International, a uh, whole host of, of different people, all the way from you know, team members in individual feature teams, helping them how to est uh, figure out how to estimate better, all the way through to uh, working with exco board members uh, helping them understand what's in it for them and what they what what moving to this new way of working is actually going to physically mean for them and what they may need to do differently with their organization moving forward so um, i would consider myself what i call a full stack coach um, and uh, and by that uh, is that you know i i have the ability or, or uh, i'm comfortable working with teams all the way through to uh, board and CTO uh, and C-suite level uh, uh, people. So, um, so yeah, and I think that's that's key, right? Um, there, any of you who've been in organisations that have have had agile coaches in, um, you've probably experienced those coaches who, who on the face of it, they know a lot, right? They've read a lot of books, but actually, you give them a real life problem, and they really sometimes struggle with it. So, I think um, you know, as I said, I've got the war wounds, I've got the bruises, um, I've made momentous mistakes in my past. And uh, you know, I've always also had some really good successes. So there you go. But as an AtWest, that's where we want to be. We want to become a purpose-led organization that can deliver better outcomes for our customers, colleagues, shareholders, and for a wider society. That's our purpose. And I, I, I love that because it could be written for any organization, right? We we all want to, we all could could, you know, uh, kind of back that purpose. <laughs> If we look at um, why we're even considering change, and this is change, right? Um, you know, the, the biggest bullet point on that slide there really is the one on the top left, increasing customer expectations. Our customers in whatever industry that we work in at the moment, anyone on this call, our customers' expectations are very different from how they were five, um, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, the way that business and technology are integrated uh, are, are, are so important now. Right? If I go back to when I started as a graduate back in 1996, 
the IT department were the people who looked after the monitors and looked after the printers. Now the IT department are running you know, safety critical or highly critical uh, systems that without which the, the organization or the business wouldn't survive. So, um, you know, quite often businesses silo themselves around business and technology. We need to start breaking down those barriers and see actually it's, we're just everyone working towards the same goal, which is delivering outcomes to our customers. So there's a ton of stuff on that slide that you could kind of uh, say, well, this is why we're changing. Um, and you couldn't disagree with all of them. But I think uh, for us, uh, for me, it's the increasing customers' expectations. So here's a, here's a little bit of a pop quiz. Uh, number of years it took for each product to gain 50 million users. So I'm going to do the top line first. So does anyone want to come off mute and have a guess how long it took in years for airlines to reach 50 million users? Anyone, make a, anyone wants to make a pun? Just a guess. How many years? 30. 30, okay, 30 years, good one. And, it, and how about ATMs, how about cash points? How long did it take before 50 million people were using cash points around the world? Five years. Five, okay, so you've got 30 for airlines and five for ATMs, there you go. So a little bit longer than you thought, 68 years it took for airlines to reach 50 million users. 18 years for, for cash points. So how about the bottom row? Now, this is a little bit closer. We were a little bit more related to this. So how long did it take for 50 million users for computers? And how long did it take Pokemon Go to reach 50 million users? Anyone want to take a guess at those two? Fifty for computer and maybe three years for Pokemon. Okay, 50 years for computers. Anyone... Anyone agree or disagree with the three years for Pokemon? Yes, I reckon a year. A year. Six, six, months. six months. Six months. Three months. Four months. Okay, okay. How about if I said uh, 19 days? No. <laughs> right? 19 days Pokemon Go, go took to take 50 million users. Um, that, that there, is a, there is another example of this slide, and there is one that beats it, but it's not necessarily politically correct. It's an adult website that took, I think, 17 hours to reach 50 million users. Um, but yeah, uh, let, let, let's gloss over that one for now. Um, so yeah, so there you go. That's what I mean by increasing customer expectations, okay? 19 days to reach 50, 50 million users for Pokemon Go, and that really, really brings it home. So, you know, if we look at, in the last 30 years, and this is pretty much my, my, my career so far, right? If we look at some statistics um, around uh, projects or programs that have typically been, been worked on, there was a survey done in, I think it was quite a long time ago, now, 2012. Um, so you can see that 168% of uh, projects uh, uh, go over budget, 66% of them are deemed failures, 180% go over target time, 68% of all technology projects have marginal outright failure, and these last two are the really interesting ones for me and probably for, for this audience on the call. 68% of technology projects fail due to poor requirements. And yet we typically spend 41% of, of, of our time spent gathering those requirements. Now there's something fundamentally wrong there. Um, if we spend nearly half our, the time in projects and programs gathering requirements, but 68% of the time, those same projects fail due to poor requirements. Now, why, why is that, right? And, and what, what's changed in, in the last 30 years to, to kind of bring this to a head, to bring this, uh, to, to, to highlight this? Now, this deck I kind of put together from a number of other decks, so it may feel a little bit disjointed, but I wanted to get its, uh, content in here that's going to bring you the most value. So apologies if it, if it feels a little bit kind of clunky, but... What I wanted to do right at the start is kind of highlight that even though we've all come together to talk about the you know, common uh, definition of Agile, Agile shouldn't be actually the thing that we're looking to, to achieve. This, that isn't the goal that, that the organizations or us should be trying to head for. Um, you know, if, if I gave each one of you a post-it note right now and said, could you write on that post-it note what, what Agile means to you? I pretty much guarantee that every single one of you are going to write something different on that post-it note. Not one of you will write the same thing. And I think, you know, what I am going to give to you today, hopefully, is a my common definition of, of over 16 years of doing Agile of what, you know, if, if I got stuck in a lift with Alison Rose, my CEO, and she said, 
tell me what agile is or tell me what new ways of working is you know i'm going to give you a definition that you could use if you if you're in the same situation i'm also hopefully going to give you a lot of other stuff that can help you back that up so agile isn't the goal if you turn if you are in a company and they say right we're going to roll out agile uh, or we've got to be more agile actually that's not necessarily the, the the goal that we should be trying to achieve right so so what is our goal what should we be trying to achieve because agile is actually a means to an end what we should be trying to do are these three things here now I, when i go and work work with a an individual or team or an organization doesn't really matter what level or how many people there's three questions that i use as almost like a litmus test to try and help me understand where they are on their maturity kind of journey uh, around new ways of working and these are those three questions um and you can use these um the first question is well how often are you delivering and it sounds a really simple question but most of the time especially in uh, in, in organizations the size of, of natwest you know the, the answer to that question is oh um every six months or every eight months or 12 months or you know some parts of the organization are every 18 months and you think wow every 18 months you know going back to increasing customer expectations in pokemon go 18 days it took them to reach 50 million users and yet we're releasing every 18 months we probably need to get better at that so delivering frequently for me means um two months or less so think about it are you delivering to your stakeholders or your customers and we'll talk about the definition of customer in a moment at least every once every at least once every couple of months and 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 really probably more, more often than that all right so some some organizations some companies now are pushing multiple times every day into production um and there's huge benefits because of that but just because we're delivering frequently doesn't necessarily mean we we're delivering any old rubbish frequently we need to have a really good idea of the things that are going to make our customers and stakeholders really smile you know if we could deliver them one thing today what would it be and if you can't if you're a product owner and you can't answer that question you should be able to right you should know your customers understand your customers and say right okay these are the top three or five or ten things that my customer would really like to be delivered you know and in this order if i could give them one thing this would it be you know, so you should need to make sure that you're delivering things in an order that's going to bring your customers the most value. And don't get caught up on that word customer, right? You know, so it doesn't necessarily always mean the, the customer that walks in into our branches in, in terms of NatWest. You know, you have potentially multiple internal customers before you even hit an external customer. So my definition of customer is any person or thing, and thing could be a system, that is using the product or service that your team is producing. And if you think of it from that perspective, you know, you, you know, if you're producing an API, for example, you're a technology team producing an API, your, 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 your product is the API and your customers may be other parts of the same organization who are using that API. Um, you know, and um, you know, as, as you grow up the hierarchy, you eventually get to the customer. But you know, any body or thing that's using the product or service that you are providing as, as a team. And lastly, um, are you as an individual are you as a team and are you as an organization continuously improving? You know, one, one question that I ask Scrum Masters quite often is, well, how much more productive is your team than you were this time six months ago? And you know what? Most Scrum Masters will struggle to answer that question. But, you know, fundamentally, it's one of the things that, you, you know, the, the top things you should be tracking as a, as a Scrum Master is an understanding of what is your trajectory? How, how are you optimizing the team, right? You know, and it may not be a lot, but you should have a good understanding from empirical evidence about how you are getting better and improving outcomes for your customers um, through the work that you're doing as a team and as a scrum master. So are you delivering frequently? Are you delivering things in an order that brings your customers the most value? And are you continuously improving? Now, if you can hand on heart, turn around and tell me that, Darren, we can tick all three of those boxes, we can stop there. Whatever process or framework or way of working that you're doing, keep on doing it. Because, you know, if you're delivering every two months and you're continuously improving, that's fantastic because in another year's time, you may be delivering every one month, right? So, so I think all of these things are a kind of virtuous cycle that kind of feed into each other. However, if you are not able to tick all three of those boxes, or circles in this case, um, or even one or two of them, then there are agile methods, frameworks, techniques, whatever you want to call them, that can potentially help you get to a point where you are able to deliver all three of those or tick through those boxes so to my point a moment ago agile is a means to an end to help us do those three things on the slide there 
So let's give a definition of agile then. I think these three bullet points here are, um, are a little bit stereotypical, right? So I'm going to whistle them quite quickly. It's not about doing more work in less time. A lot of new people to agile, especially the front and the project manager variety, uh, turn around and say, hey, we're agile. We can, I can just make it up as we go along and add, add work to your backlog and still get everything delivered on the same day. Um, no, that's not how it works. Um, it is a little bit about working smarter rather than harder, and that's the one I really don't really like. Um, but it's about generating more value with less work, and it's the first time I've used that word value here, I think, uh, this evening. And value is really important to understand what that is and who we're delivering and why we're doing the work that we're doing. And again, you know, a lot of the time I go and ask teams, well, why are you doing that piece of work? And the answer is, well, because we've been told to. I'm like, well, that's not an answer, right? Why are you doing it? What is the outcome we're going to achieve on the back of, on the back of that work? Oh, well, we're, 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 we're updating the database schema from version two to version three. Okay, but why are you doing that? Well, to improve the, uh, to prove the number of imports we can do per second. Yeah, but why are you doing that? Oh, it's because at the moment the, the imports are too slow. So why are the imports too slow? Well, the customers say that their journey through uh, this particular route through our application takes too long and it, it, it's uh, our competitor's application does it far faster than us. Fantastic, that's why we're doing it, to improve the customer experience of this particular feature in our application. That's why we're doing it. We're not doing it because we're updating database schema two to database schema three. And quite often when I look at Teams backlogs of work, it looks like that. You know, my user story, you know, as a user, I want to update the database schema from version two to version three. No, you don't, right? As a user, as a user I want to make sure the customer uh, experience in my application is better than blah, 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 right? That's the reason why. So Agile is a way of working that enables us to be future ready and customer focused organization. That's where, that's what my definition is, right? If I get caught in a lift, I would say that statement there. It enables us to be a future ready and customer focused organization. And we do that by regularly, regularly delivering the highest value items to our customers and making sure that we're continuously improving. That's my definition. And that for me is what agile means, right? And, and we get too caught up in words and labels and badges. Um, you know, and, and when I go and work with, with parts of the organization, I just say, look, I just want to help you deliver your work better. You know, and, and that's it. That's, that's what I want to help you do. What can I do to help that? How can I bring the experience that I've got to bear with you to help you deliver stuff, for, deliver stuff better for the customer through your team? So what do we need to, to focus on to do that? Well, principally, this and this sounds really simple when I say it, right? We need to focus on the outcomes rather than the output. All too often, we focus on the work itself. This is the work we need to do. This is the output of, of this sprint. Um, you know, this sprint, we're going to deliver five user stories. Great, that's fantastic output, but what outcomes is it delivering? Uh, you know, we've all probably worked in, 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 in uh, scrum teams, for example, that, you know, their sprint goal is to deliver five user stories. That's not an outcome, that's output, right? What is the outcomes of those five user stories? Tell me why you're doing those five user stories, right? And that's the outcome that you want to achieve. So focus on outcome over outputs and just doing that will significantly improve the way that you work as a team. You know, challenging yourselves and asking yourself, what are we trying to achieve here? What are we trying to, uh, what functionality or service or thing are we trying to provide to our customers that they don't have now? So, you know, um, Monique gave the answers away to this on, on LinkedIn last night, for those of you who are on LinkedIn. So apologies for that if, 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 uh, if you saw the answers, but, um, this thing here is, is uh, done by a guy called Simon Powers, uh, who, who um, it, he's CEO of a company called Adventures with Agile. Uh, there's some great training courses in London. But one thing that, that Simon Powers pulled together was this thing called the Agile Onion. And what this distinguishes between is the things that are more visible but less powerful versus the things that are less visible and, uh, uh, sorry, more visible and less powerful versus things that are less visible and more powerful. And um, I'm going to ask you a question here. What do you think is the first thing? What do you think out of these gray boxes? What's the most visible but least powerful gray box? Anyone got any idea? Tools. 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 Yeah, spot on, right? You know, I've, again, I've lost count of the number of teams I've 
you know, are you, we've been told we need to be agile, so we've started using Jira. So we, you're there, we've done it now, we've ticked the box. And you go, oh, right, okay, fantastic. Great, it's great that you're using Jira, okay, but how are you using it? Oh, I don't know, we're just using it as a list to store our work. Okay, right, okay, well, what comes next then? What's the next gray box? Methods? Maybe. Methods, and by methods, I mean things like, you know, typically, here, you know, Scrum and Kanban and Scrumban and all that flying around quite a lot. That's what I mean by methods, right? Now, um, again, um, we do Scrum, so we must be agile. Um, it's not necessarily the right answer. Um, and, you know, uh, most of the teams that I, if, if I'm really honest, most of the teams you say they're doing Scrum aren't doing Scrum because Scrum's a little bit like champagne, right? Unless you're doing all of it, you're not doing Scrum and, you know, you're just doing iterative development. But but most of the organizations that I've worked with, if you look at the training and kind of the introduction to Agile that you get, what does it focus on? It focuses on those two there, tools and methods. I don't know about you, but NatWest Group, we spent literally the last two years, you know, on around tools and methods. And that's great. It helps people understand around tools and methods. It's easy to train people on those. Um, but it's not necessarily the things that are going to make the biggest difference to our organization. Any, anybody got any idea what comes next? What was the next gray box? Principles. Principles, that's right. And I'm going to skip through the next one. Principles, values, and mindset. Um, and the things, things at the top are, are quite often what you hear, you know, very red project managers turn around and say, well, that's all fluffy stuff. That doesn't really matter, right? We just need to concentrate on, on you know, delivering the project plan, you know, and doing the work to, to the timetable. And, and I would, you know, vehemently argue with that because the things like principles, values, and mindsets. They are physically about the way that we're working together as an organization and the way that we're working together as a team. And you know, if, if, if we haven't got the right mindset, the right values, the right principles, all we're doing is what I call faux agile. Or, or you, you, walk around your, you walk around the organization, all you see is what I call agile BS, right? People nodding their heads and wearing labels with new badges on, right? I'm not a project manager anymore, I'm a product owner. I'm not a team lead anymore. I'm a scrum master, et cetera, right? And, and all they're really doing is, is doing what I call cargo cult. So they're, they're following the motions. They're following the recipe or the ingredients, as, you know, but when they take the cake out of the oven, they have no idea what that cake should taste like or what it even should look like. They're just literally following it by the letter, following it by rote. You really need to have an appreciation of the mindset, the values and the principles to get a really good appreciation of what the methods and the tools you should be, you know, sh should bring you. Um, I want to touch on complexity a little bit um, because this is something that a lot of people ignore um, at, at your peril. Um, just like people ignored gravity for a long time, complexity exists just in the same way and you can't ignore it. If you ignore it, then that's when you will start being one of those statistics. And I think the fourth slide I put up around you know, the failure of the projects. And what this, what this diagram is really showing is, you know, ask yourself, you know, in the recent projects that you've worked on, how much, when you started that project, how much did you really know about how you were going to deliver it? Were you absolutely close to certainty, i.e. we've done this 100%, 100 times before, we're just going to take something out of the drawer, rinse and repeat, we don't need to change anything, we don't need to do anything, um, it, it's just exactly the same as what we're going to do, in which case you're going to be very close to the, the, the left-hand side of the x-axis. Or, you know, did you have a particular problem where you go, do you know what, we've got to figure that out. We have no idea how we ingest 2 million records a second because the most we've done is 500,000 records so far. So we're going to need to figure out what infrastructure, what technology, what APIs, what libraries we're going to use, you know, what infrastructure we're going to use to be able to ingest 2 million records a second. In which case you're right over on the right hand side of the X axis. So how much did you know about how you delivered your project? And on the, on the Y axis, we've got what it is we're going to deliver. So down to the bottom of the, of the y-axis, you know, you know exactly what you're going to deliver. The requirements are 100% fixed. You know, you, you, you know that those requirements are not going to change. The customer knows exactly what they want, and they can give you a list of requirements now and come back in 12 months' time, and those list of requirements will be exactly the same. And your interpretation of them is 100%. So if I ask for X, you're going to get X. That's all the way down on the left-hand side. All the way at the top of the left-hand side, you know, and BAE Systems is, uh, Applied Intelligence is a good example of this. I remember getting customers come to us and saying, hey, we've been told by the regulator that you're the organization that can provide system X. We need that. Can you tell us what it is, please? Right? So they have really no, no idea what they want when they start the project. 
but you can bet your bottom dollar by the time you deliver it to them, they will be experts in it. So think about where you started your project and think about if you were to plot, uh, plot yourself on that, on that diagram, where would you put yourself? And let me give you a quick example here, right? So um, what we mean by a simple project is here's, the leg, here's a box of a Lego car. You've got all the pieces you need to build a Lego, uh, to, to build that Lego car. And here's the instructions from one to 11 to show you explicitly how you put that car together and how you take all those Lego pieces and build it, right? It's, it's, it's not, it, you know, you can get some incredibly difficult Lego um, uh, kits, right? But, you know, you get all the, the instructions, you get all the pieces. So it's a fairly simple task to go through to, to the one, one to 11 or one to 100 steps to build that Lego thing. So that's you know close to agreement. You know what it is. You've got a picture on the box, right? And you 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 know exactly how you're going to do it because you've got it laid out instructions one to ten. That's different to hey, I I want to build a kit car. So I've bought this kit car of you know, and I've got all the pits that I've got all the bits to build a kit car. They've all been delivered in a in a storage container, and I know that over the next two and a half years, I've got this construction manual, but I have to build this kit car from all the pieces that are in my garage. Uh, some of them are going to fit together, some of them aren't. Um, I'm going to end up with bits of bolts that left over at the end and go, where does that go, right? So that's a complicated project. You're going to have to do a lot more collaboration. You're going to have to talk to other owners and say, where does this bit of bolt go, please? How did you build this? Because I'm really struggling. And that's more of a complicated project. It's, it's, it's still kind of, you can still see it in your head and what it's going to look like because you've got this vision, but there's a, there's a lot more stuff that you're going to need that's going to fly around. A complex project is, right, I want you to, now you've built your kit car, I want you to drive it from Land's End to John O'Groats. Fine, okay, but there's multiple routes. What time of the day is it? What time, what's the weather like? What roads are we gonna take? Is there any traffic jams? You know, it's, it's a lot more complex to predict how that's gonna happen. Um, and, and I often say, right, it's, it doesn't matter how many clever people you put in a room and how long you give them, you will not be able to predict everything that's going to happen in your project or program. And that's especially so in the days of COVID. Who could have predicted that? Um, and the last one is, right, I want, to, I want to take your kit car. I want to turn, I want you to turn it into a hovercraft. <laughs> right, and if any of you have seen the Top Gear where they turn a van into a hovercraft, um, yeah, they made it up as they went along and they had multiple tries to do it. But that's what we mean by complexity. And we, we need to appreciate that complexity exists. Now, when I've, I, I used to give this face-to-face -face or electronically, I used to, to kind of gauge and ask the, 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 the teams to plot it on a map. And this is where they put their, yeah, this is where they started their project. You can see here, hardly any of our projects start in that simple area. A couple of them started in the complicated area, but the majority of our projects started in the complex space. Some started up in the red space. And another, another group here, there you go, that's probably even more around the complex area. But think about it. Traditionally, where, are we, where does our traditional way of project planning assume that we start our projects? What color? What color does, when, when we're asked to build out a project plan or a Gantt chart, where does it assume that we are? Oh, everything's simple. Everything's simple. Everything's green, right? We know exactly how we're going to deliver it, and we know exactly what we're going to deliver, and we know exactly who's going to deliver it, and we know that Bob's going to be doing this job on 23rd of August in 2021, right? So we create this Gantt chart, um, uh, and, and, and you know, we, we kind of bury our head in the sand that this complexity thing doesn't exist, all right? And that's the reason why the 168% of those, uh, those, those questions go out the wind as if projects fail in, in that slide four of the statistics that I gave you. Um, so does anyone know what Gantt stands for, by the way? Uh, okay, I, I, I'll let you know. I, I say this with a tongue in cheek. Uh, Gantt stands for general assumption, never trust this. I'll leave that with you. Um, so, so here we go. So this is what we're trying to do, right? So we're trying to move. And remember I talked about more frequent releases? Um, this is kind of why, right? So you know, if we're delivering once a year or once every six months or once every um, uh, you know, 12 months, whatever it is, we've got fairly rare release events. We've got a lot of effort for that release. And we've got a lot of risk associated with that re uh, 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 release because we've got a lot of stuff in there. So when we roll it out and it doesn't necessarily work, it's like, wow, crap, okay, this thing doesn't work. Which one of the 15 new features and 200 bug fixes has introduced the problem that we're seeing? 
So it's, it's, you know, that's the typical problems that I've had in the past, right? You know, I've been there at three o'clock in the morning trying to roll out a, a deployment by, by 5.30 in the morning for when our customer needs to start using the, the system again, because when we rolled it out at 11 p.m. and did some testing, it didn't work, right? And then we discover that the rollback plan isn't necessarily as robust as we thought it was, right? You know, I'm, uh, that, that's happened many a times, and I'm sure you guys have, have had the same, same issue. So the smaller we can make the release, the smoother effort because there's less change and less risk there is. And suddenly we can start thinking about fixing forward rather than rolling back. So, you know, if we roll out uh, a new release and it introduces two new features and three new bug fixes, you can quite quickly see that what the problem is and say, well, actually, yep, I know what caused that. Let me go and fix that. Yep, I saw the, I can see the problem now. Bang, here's a new release. We'll, we'll push out that new release. And uh, the customer didn't even know that that problem existed um, because you fixed it before they rolled up at 5.30 in the morning and, you know, that they didn't even know about it. You know, those of you who use Facebook on your phone, um, and my kids always moan at me because they say Facebook's for old people. Um, they And I can see some of you nodding now. Um, but yeah, whether you like it or not, Facebook rolls out three or four new releases to your phone every week. And, you, and most of the time, you're not even aware it happens. Um, so the key thing here, though, is it, it's working product or service. It's not, hey, hey we could make a release and um, it's tested, but we're going to store it on this network drive. And we're going to store this week's build on the network drive and network's build on the network drive. And six months later, we're going to make this big release there. And that doesn't help because you're doing that right hand side again. So there's a big difference between incremental and iterative delivery. And, and a lot of people like the slide and take a, a lot away from it because when, when I go and work with teams, what I see a lot is the bottom version, right? I hey, we're agile, we, 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 we work in sprints or we work in, in, a, in an incremental or iterative nature or time boxes, whatever word you wanna call for it. And they say, yeah, yeah, we do that. And I say, well, how often do you release? Oh, well, we can't release it until it's all done. And it's a complicated system, so we can't release until December. And um, I say, well, what, why are you doing incremental releases then if, you, if you're not, if you're effectively releasing once a year? Oh, well, we, we need to build, you know, the building blocks all in isolation and then integrate them at the, in, in the last uh, month and then test them all together and then we make our big release. I, I say, well, how is that agile? Um, so just taking your, your 12 month project and slicing it up into, I don't know, month long deliverables, but still delivering everything at the end. Do you know what? That's not necessarily agile, but do you know what? That's what a lot of people call agile. And if you compare that to the top one, right? The top one's different. What can I do with that, with the output of every single iteration? This is a picture, it's a painting. What do you do with paintings? You look at them. You look at them, where'd you put them? On the wall. Hang them on the wall. What can you do with, with the output from iteration one? Right, feedback. No. You can hang it on the wall. You can you can invite people around. People can see what's what what you're doing, and you can invite feedback. So you can say your mate, best mate comes around and says, "Yeah, that's really good. I love the idea that how you're doing this." But it looks like she's smoking a cigarette. Do you know what? Now you said that I can't unsee it. I need to make that change. So you get that change made, and then you add some color to it, and you say, "Actually, do you know what? I, I, I prefer it a little bit darker." And then you get to iteration four, and, and your artist says, "Well, look, do you know what? Before I spend the money and put this on on oil, on canvas." Can I just check you like it? And you go, do you know what? I've run out of money. <laughs> I can't afford to put it on canvas. So do you know what? I'm going to take what I've got. Thank you very much. And I'll come back to you in six months time to commission you to put it onto to canvas. You've got output at the end of every iteration. Whereas the bottom one, as soon as you put paint to canvas on, it, on increment one, number one, you've got, you can't change. There's no scope for change. There's no scope for innovation. There's no scope for learning when you do the bottom one. But yet most companies or most teams deliver stuff in that bottom way and they turn around and say that they're agile. And there's a really good litmus test that you can do. Um, ask yourself, well, if we lost funding right now, could we put what we have built into production? It may not be fully featured. It may not, it may be very limited in, in functionality, but could, would it provide value to our, to our customers? And could we put it into production? I think that's a really good check acids test that you could ask yourself. And in this case, you know, you could hang that painting on, on the wall after iteration one, right? Um, I wanted to touch on this, and I did say it's a little bit fragmented, this presentation, but hopefully it makes sense in the long run. Um, organizational structure and culture is a critical part in being able to, to do all this stuff, right? 
Um, this always makes me laugh. This, this little red thingy down here is our Agile project. And it's not generally the case nowadays because organizations are generally uh, better at understanding what they need to do. But definitely if I went back 10 to 15 years, you know, I was unique in, in, in my organizations in terms of what I was doing in my team, right? And that definitely was the case. Um, so we need to understand that, that the organization needs to understand that this isn't just something that's going to affect technology. This isn't something that's going to affect a couple of teams. I said at the start that I've been working in HR and marketing and, and risk. Every single part of the organization needs to, needs to be a part of it because there's something called Conway's Law, which some of you may be familiar with, which is basically states that any organization that designs a system will inevitably produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. Um, if you've got four different development teams, um, that are labeled um, business analysts, um, architects, developers, testers, integrators, um, then your, your system, I bet you, will consist of four different layers of technology. Um, so that's generally what Conway's law is, is saying, is that, you know, have a look at your communication structure of your teams or teams of teams or your organization, and chances are that the way you're your your product or solution or platform is architected is is in that way if you've got a team of front-end developers and a team of database admins you will have a database admin layer and a front-end layer right um so so the, the 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 design of your organization is really really important and most organization charts look a little bit like this like this this is why i love this it makes me laugh um so hierarchies um by their very nature uh, are very difficult to work with because um, there's always someone in charge. There's always someone who's making decisions that are that are a higher priority than someone else. Who shouts the loudest gets the room. If you haven't heard of a, a term called hippo, um, you've all um, have a hippo in all the meetings you go for. And next, you know, when you're in a meeting tomorrow, trying to figure out who the hippo is. And the hippo is the highest paid person's opinion in the room. Um, so when you walk in there tomorrow with a smile on your face, say, all right, yeah, I know who the hippo is in this room. Okay. So the organization or organizational structures are a really important factor when thinking about new ways of working or agile or whatever you want to call it. All right. And the reason is, is that we, we really want to get away from kind of uh, hierarchy and move into, you know, more of a team based structure where the teams are a little bit more autonomous, they've got more decision-making uh, capability, they're, they're built end-to-end. -end. Um, what I mean by end-to-end -end is, is that, you know, traditionally, this is how we, we build teams. You know, we've got, in this scenario, we've got business analysts, architects, developers, and testers, right? Now, the problem here is that it's a sequential process. You know, the B BAs have to finish all their work before the, the architects can finish theirs. The architects have to finish all their work before the developers can start building. And there's, there's a number of problems with that. Firstly, is every single time you have a handoff, you introduce delay. Um, you have problems with ownership. Who owns the thing that we're producing here? If we roll it out into production and something doesn't work or there's a requirement that was missed, um, whose fault was that? Was it the testing team for not testing it? Was it the development team for not developing it in the right way? Was it the architects for not using the right uh, framework uh, or to, to add that capability? Or was it the business analysis fault for, for not detecting that that requirement was even missing in the first place, right? So it's a little bit like Chinese whispers. So, you know, and, and ask yourself, how do you prioritize, right? This is an ideal scenario, but most of the time, Team Yellow will probably have multiple Team Reds feeding into it. So who makes a decision in terms of, do I do A or do I do B? Is it who I shout the loudest? Is it who, who's going to bring the most money for the organization? Who makes a decision in terms of what's most important to the other? And more importantly, who is responsible for quality? You know, is it the testing team at the end or is it the whole, the whole group as, as a whole? Because chances are no one was going to put their hand up and say, I'm responsible for, for, for quality there. So what's the alternative? The alternative is, is what we call a feature team. And some of you uh, might may understand this. So a feature team is a team that contains all of the skills required to deliver the work you're, you're asking it to deliver. So whereas we had a business analyst, a developer, um, an a, a a, a architect and a, and a tester before, okay, great, let's get those guys together and put them in a room together and give them a piece of work and say, off you go. That's a basic feature team, okay? So they can deliver all of the work without any handoffs. They can do it all within the team 
And you know, it resolves all the problems that we had with the more traditional structures. So there's no handoffs, there's full accountability. It's very easy to prioritize. So feature teams, uh, component teams or platform teams to feature teams is a really big change. But can you see there that that's an organizational structural change? So if you don't under, if, you know, if your organization isn't bought into doing this, it makes it very difficult to try and do it in, in an existing um, organizational structure. So and what do we mean by team, right? So I, I've, I've gone around that West and I've been consistently surprised saying, saying, how many teams have you got? Oh, we've got just one team. And my, my red flag gets, you know, gets slightly kind of, okay, well, how big's your team then? Oh, we've got a team of 50. And I'm like, that's not a team. I've worked in organizations that have been smaller than that team, right? So, you know, and this is because of um, how do we communicate as, uh, with each other? And, and a really litmus test here is, you know, by the, but by the time you get past nine or 10 people in a team, if you ask yourself, do you know what everyone else is doing in the team? And, you know, from a, from a, from a size perspective, the answer to that question should be yes, right? I know what everyone in, else in my team is doing. If I don't, then the team's probably too big. And obviously, Jeff Bezos in Amazon uh, coined the two pizza term uh, uh, analogy in terms of if, if your team's too big to feed the two pizzas, it's too big, right? And you need to need to reduce its size. Obviously, that depends on how big your pizzas are and where you're buying them from. But if you take an American large pizzas, that's probably quite large. Um, but yeah, so think about your team size and think about limiting that, okay? The other thing I'm going to share is organizing your work before your people. Um, a lot of the time when you think about what, what is it we need to do, why do we need to do it, who are we doing it for, and in what order would we like to, do, to, to deliver it, the four whys. Before we even think about people or teams or skill sets, let's talk about the four whys and make sure that we fully understand all of those items. You know, so that if I turn to around to your team and say, well, what, what thing, we, if, I, if, I give you, if I gave you unlimited resources, with all of the skill sets in the world, how much of your backlog of work could be delimited, that could be uh, delivered over the next two weeks? You know, so get to a point where you fully understand what you need to do, because then what you can do is you can turn around to your organization or your people or your teams and say, well, okay, well, given this is our objective, it's our roadmap for the next 12 months or whatever, what's the, the optimum design of our people? How can we most efficiently deliver that work? So how do we organize our people around the work? And usually it's the other way around. Usually we've got existing teams and we get some work come in and we say, okay, we'll give this work to team X or we'll give this work to team Y. And the problem is with that is if you've got uh, platform teams, a bit of front end work comes in, you give it to the front end team. A bit of back end work comes in, you give it to the back end team. A lot of back end work comes in, the back end team get very busy. The front end team is sitting there with their feet on the table. Not the most efficient use of your of your people. So think about the optimum way you can organize your people around the work. Because once you've done that, you can start uh, delivering value iteratively. Um, hopefully, once uh, every two months or less. And then you can ask yourself the question: How do we get better? How do we continuously improve? How do we speed up our work? And that is an iterative process. You do that in, in, you know, every two, every few weeks, every few months. You know. Um, organizing your work, reorganizing your people, delivering value iteratively and speeding up the work in the op most optimum way to deliver the outcomes for your customers. And to do that, we need to shift away from thinking about projects and thinking about products. Um, and thinking back to my time at BA Systems, Monique, this is something that was very difficult for, for BA Systems at the time. Um, because we formed everything around projects. We, you know, we, we built a team of, around project one, a team around project two. And then you know, we had a, an inf inf internal infrastructure team who did all the other stuff. The trouble with that though, is that project one will deliver a particular feature um, and then project two will deliver the same feature and do it in a completely different way. There was no commonality, there was no consistency. So you know, thinking about this, and thinking about to the previous slide and organizing your work better. How do we organize our work? How do we take all of this input and turn it into a effectively a prioritized backlog of work so that we understand what's the most important thing and what's the most least important thing? And you know, we use um, that may be done through a, a product owner team or, or a business analyst team, whatever you want to call them, right? Or architects, enterprise architects or subject matter experts, but somewhere there's a group of people um, uh, or person whose job it is, is to take all the input from all these different projects and prioritize it based upon whatever you want. I don't really care, right? Whether it's value, ROI, dependencies, constraints, or, you know, which one 
you know, whatever, some, some prioritization mechanism happens and you end up with a prioritized backlog. Because once you've organized your work and done that, you can then organize your teams around the work. So, okay, we're going to use six teams. They're going to pull from the same backlog. Um, we can work together to understand when, you know, when things are going to be delivered. The, the business, uh, so to speak, above the dotted line is responsible for what we are, what we want and why we, why we're going to, and why we're doing it. And the delivery teams below the dotted line are responsible for how there's a separation of concerns there. All right. You know, the, 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 um, the, the, below the bottom line doesn't tell the business what or why we should need something and and uh, above the dotted line doesn't tell the, the developers or the delivery teams how they should do something right that obviously they'll collaborate together to for the best outcome um you know but you know the business team won't turn around to a software team and say that should be multi-threaded it's like okay well that, why do you need it multi-threaded well we want high performance okay we you don't need to be multi-threaded to do that okay so 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 there's a separation of concerns that's important because the delivery teams can then start iteratively, iteratively delivering their output and, and playing it back into the product owner teams and again we rinse and repeat continuously improve so that's how organize the work organize the people uh, deliver a value iteratively and then speed up the work we need to accept that failure happens or in other words learn faster or test and learn figure it out um, so I, I love, I've been watching these rocket launches, SN4 through to SN12 uh, uh, now. Um, so, and the most recent one, they actually managed to land properly. Um, uh, this is Elon Musk, Elon Musk, SpaceX. And it's been fascinating watching them go through this learning cycle and every single failure they've learned from, every single uh, next one on, they, they've got a little bit further on in the kind of timeline. Um, so we need to be prepared to, to try new stuff. And sometimes that new stuff works and sometimes it, just, it doesn't. So to, if we want to be truly innovative, we need to be happy that, you know, something may or may not work. We tried it, it didn't work. Now it doesn't necessarily mean it won't work in six months time. So we need to have a culture in our organization, bringing it back to that word culture and organization again, that is okay for, for, uh, for test and learns to happen. Okay. And that could be at a small level. It could be at a very large level, you know, rolling out an agile transformation arguably is a test and learn, right? So let's start small and work out big. Um, I love this quote by Henry Ford. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. All right. Um, I hear so many people turn around to me and say, Darren, this is all great, but it'll never work in my area or, or it's, um, uh, it, 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 it's, we're too busy at the moment for any change, you know, well, let's kick the can down the road and do this in six months time. You, you need to understand that, you know, um, you need to do stuff differently. You need to have more of a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And, um, you know, to do that, you need to embrace that, that kind of challenge of, you know, well, it may work or it may not. So just in summary then, uh, bringing it back to the kind of outcome of this talk, common understanding, finding a common understanding. Agile is a way of working that enables us to be a future ready and customer focused organization. And we do that by delivering frequently, by delivering things in an order that brings our customers most value and continuously improving. So wherever you're working at the moment, whoever you're working for, you know, whatever point you are on your open quote agile journey, you know, just challenge yourselves and say, well, is our are we still focused on, on those things on the screen there? Or have we kind of lost our way a little bit and we're focusing on the process or the tools more than the other stuff? Um, so I think that's pretty much it. Um, I'm gonna say thank you and I'll leave my contact details on. I've seen some people ping me on LinkedIn already whilst I've been talking, but hopefully that's been useful. I told you it was gonna be a little bit of a brain dump, um, but you know, I think that, that, was, that was my interpretation and how I, tend to work with people um, in all the organizations that I've worked with. Um, and hopefully you, you, can, you can take some away tonight that you can go and use at your organization tomorrow. So thank you very much. And I'm open to questions. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. That's very useful. So we just opened up the, the, the poll for, for feedback. But meanwhile, yeah, we welcome questions. Just unmute your line or just put in there the chat box. Yeah. Oh, we've got the poll going. Yeah. How did I find out about this event? There's not an option, Monique, that you emailed me and said, Darren, can you come and do this? So? I just have, uh, getting some. Cool. Yeah, right, have, you... we got, have we got any questions? Anyone online or anything? There's none on the chat. So. Yeah, so I do. Have... Oh, sorry. 
Okay. No, I, I, I think um, if, if people like me, they're just digesting everything that was thrown at us. I think we can all kind of relate to quite a lot of the things that um, you went through there. And uh, anyone that's been implementing Agile in a, uh, a very waterfall environment, I think will feel and recognize a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of what you were saying. So it was really useful, I think. I think, I think you know, in, in that kind of scenario, right, I've tried open quote hybrid ways of working, they never work. Right, you know, try to let yeah. You know, we've got to we've got to kind of shoehorn this agile thing into a waterfall environment or a waterfall program, and you know, it, it's everyone is disappointed. <laughs> you don't get anyone who turns around and shouts says that was brilliant, right? You know, everyone gets disappointed. And worst of all, if if that project doesn't necessarily deliver the outcomes that the people wanted, what will they turn around and blame? Oh, that's because they tried it in an agile way, right? Um, I remember one time Monique, I was in BA Systems and I went up to Bluefin and I was meeting a client and um, it was, we were pitching for a new piece of work and, and I said, look, have you, have you thought about how you want to deliver this? You know, would you consider delivering it in an agile way? And I think it was back, this was like, I don't know, 2015 or something like that. And they said, oh, no, absolutely not. We tried that agile thing two years ago. It was an absolute disaster. And I went, oh, okay, right. Well, okay, well, well fair enough. Then let's put that aside how about we do this and what I really want to do is make sure that what we deliver you is going to deliver you the outcomes that you want and this thing that we're going to build for you is going to do what you need it to do so what I'd like to do is get you really close to the de delivery life cycle to get you really kind of involved with it and show you what we're building every every couple of weeks to a month and we'd really appreciate to get your feedback for it and you know when we get that feedback we'll use that and, and help tailor where the where the product goes so that when we deliver it, you know, in, in 12 months time, you're gonna get exactly what you want. There's gonna be no surprises. And they were like, that sounds amazing. Let's do that, All right? And I just described Agile, but because I didn't <laughs> use the word Agile, I'm like, yes, we love the sound of that versus no, we've tried that Agile thing, it didn't work. And, and this, is, this is my point, all, all too often, Agile is kind of embraced by these organizations and, and, and set up to fail because of, they don't know how to do it properly. They haven't got the expertise. They 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 go half-assed, like the, the half-assed agile manifesto that I put up in slide zero. So I think it's it's really really important that you have that organizational level understanding that if we're going to do this, let's do this properly, right? You know, if we're not going to go and do it properly, we might as well stay the way that we are because we're not necessarily going to get any benefit from from going halfway. Sense. Um, any questions from, from anyone? You can unmute your line. Listen to you. Um, I've got a question. Uh, Darren, what would be your favorite agile method, i.e., Kanban, Scrum, Safe, etc., etc.? Um, not safe. <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy one, right? Um, so, so, so. Uh, so, okay, the, are you asking me personally um, what my favorite one is? Because there's, 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 there's a political kind of coachy answer to that is whatever's right for the team, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I, I will not go into a team and say, thou shalt use Scrum, right? It, would, it, should, it should be a case of well, what works for them. But me personally, um, you know, I think, I think I've got a, quite a lot of experience of successfully delivering products using Scrum. And um, I think Scrum is one of those things that once you've worked in a Scrum team, a really good Scrum team, where you know you're really working together as one, I think it's the best place. And it and, and it's it's somewhere when you're when you're not working in an area like that, you know, I miss it right now, right? You know, if I'm if I'm really honest, right? Yeah, if I look back upon the the kind of golden years, so to speak, of my career. Can I say that? I don't know. But you know what I mean? The, the, the really good projects that I've worked on and the really real big successes that I've had, it's it's been the times in those teams. And yeah, well, sometimes we had to work to challenge in timescales and had to do late nights and and get called out and, and all, yeah, but we did it together, right? You know, three o'clock in the morning, the entire team were in, right? Do, trying, to, trying to fix a problem. Um, and I think, for me, Scrum is, is probably my kind of, uh, it's my home method, so to speak, right? In the same way that C is probably my home software language. Um, so I, I will probably always default to that. Perfect, thanks a lot. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start off by saying uh, I'll uh, cover up the uh, the logo on my shirt there with the safe there. They do they do make free comfortable t-shirts that they give out at conferences. I'll say that, but uh, but. Um, no, I, I, I really liked where you talked about the, uh, the Agile Onion and how do you think we can uh, get the business stakeholders, um, uh, specifically uh, higher up in the organization to consider the higher levels of the Onion, the, the mindset and uh, values and whatnot? Um, ed education, really. It, it, it has to start there, I think. You know, and and it, it's... It's not as hard as you think. The, the, the actual thing is is getting in front of them and 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 actually getting the time to spend with them because that the, if 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 you can reason with them and show what's in it for them and and potentially what they need to do to change, it's very hard to argue against it, right? You know, when you talk about things like empowered leadership and 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 you know leading rather than managing and all that kind of stuff, it, it's it's you know they're not going to none of them are going to turn around and say no, nah, I don't agree with any of that, right? So I think I think the difficult part is getting them to enact it in their behaviors as you know it's very easy for them to say yes we do this and then they walk out the room and the first thing they do they demand is, is that i need a financial plan for the next two years and you know i i, I you know, it, it, and it and it's i think it's 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 that's where kind of executive coaching comes in i guess i think you know i i i've i i have kind of coached some senior leaders um and you know, sometimes they come onto the coaching call and say, "Do you know what? I, I, I made a massive boo boo I, I, a couple of days ago. I told someone to do this, right? Because I thought I knew best, and I realised as soon as I said it that I said the wrong thing. And I said to them, "Brilliant." He said, "What do you mean, brilliant?" I said, "Well, look at that. You you said it, and you realised the problem straight away. You wouldn't believe how many leaders won't even recognise that that they what they did or said isn't is it wasn't necessarily the wrong thing, right? So I, I think." I think helping them realize what's in it for them and helping them realize that what they perceive agile to be or new ways of working to be isn't necessarily probably isn't necessarily what they think it is. Them thinking that it's just something that tech teams do or just something that delivery need to be concerned with, that's the biggest problem, right? Um, because then then we're working agile in a waterfall way. So the cultural change is, is, is starts from the top. You know, you have to have that organizational level buy. And one of the reasons I moved to NatWest, because at some point in my career, I, I swore never to work for a financial service, but, you know, here I am. <laughs> and, uh, 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 and the reason I moved was that everywhere I had worked up until that point was a bottom-up stuff, right? I'd either have to push it or, or sell it and, and do all this stuff, right? And, and way back in 2006, this thing was really mad that, that 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 was hard to do and and nat west group they approached me and said look we're doing a, effectively a, a an exec sponsored um transformation top down and i was like oh that sounds good not not done one of those before get me involved right um and it was almost the inverse right we had to persuade teams and sell it to the teams as opposed to trying to sell it to management so it was it was very very different from what what we've done before um but yeah Thank you, thanks, Katie. Any other questions? I actually do have one, um, Darren. Um, it could be quite broad, but um, you mentioned that um, Agile is about outcomes, not output. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, I'm just trying to, to figure out how diversity and inclusion is, is it part of Agile? Because sometimes people will be like, oh, as long as I get to the outcome, i.e. delivering, have the best results, uh, highest value to the clients, I don't necessarily need to think about like how I have done it. I could be- uh, Yeah, yeah, big, yeah. Big myth, big myth. So, so yeah, it's, oh, oh, we're agile. We don't need to do documentation anymore. Oh, we're agile. We don't need to do architecture. We just make it up as we go along, right? You know, I think I think that's that's a um, incredibly dangerous way of, of deliver, delivering or developing anything, right? Um, you'll end up with a dead product very, very quickly. Um, what I mean by a dead product is something you can't do anything with and you have to throw it all away and start again, right? So I think, you know, architecture, um, um, business analysts, development, testing, it all still needs to be done in equal measures, um, but you do it in a slightly different way. Rather than that sequential pattern, uh, you know, one finishes, the next one starts, the next one starts, 
you do it in that feature team just enough based upon what you need at the moment. And what, what you need at the moment doesn't mean what you need for this current sprint, mm. right? Just in the same way you need a project plan, you should have a roadmap of whatever it is you're building. You should be able to say, right, this is the feature we're building now. This is the feature we're building in two or three months' time. This is the feature we're looking to build at the end of the year. So that you can say, well, actually, if, based upon this roadmap and the current features, um, and, and you know, as well as a feature roadmap, you should probably have an architectural roadmap that runs alongside it to support the features. This is how we're going to do This is how the product's going to grow, because if we don't have the architectural roadmap, we are literally making it up as we go along. And in eight months' time, we'll have to throw a load of work away because we picked the wrong framework back at the start. And I've done that as well. Um, so, so it doesn't mean you need to, you don't need to do all that. You do need to do all that. All the things that you talked about, the way that you do it is slightly different. Yeah, that makes sense. And how about the in terms of diversity and inclusion? Like, mm -hmm. because I think that's that's about okay, how as a team we work together. So because they would they could just be saying that oh, as long as the team is delivering, I don't necessarily need to to think about how people feel about or how, how they interact with one another. So how, how do you see how diversity set into um, Agile in general? So, so, so well-being, right? So it's so, so massively important, right? Because that's part of your productivity. If a team doesn't believe they can deliver something, they'll be a miserable team, right? So, so if you've got a product owner or a team that are over-committing and failing to deliver their sprint outcomes every two weeks or every three weeks, then you will have a miserable team very, very quickly, right? So, so what you need to focus on is, is sustainable delivery, uh, delivering the right amount of work in your time box iterations, however long they are, and making sure that the team as a whole are optimizing the